All rise. Hello, I'm Mark Curry, a former trial court judge with more than 34 years of total courtroom experience. In this video, we're going to be talking about trial objections. It's an important trial skill that lawyers need to know during any kind of hearing, either before the judge or a jury, because often you're going to need to make objections or respond to them. In this video, I'm going to be talking about the most common trial objections uh, that you'll come across. There's also, also some trial tactics and strategies about how to make them and respond to them, as well as my own trial tips regarding trial objections that I've learned from my years of experience in the courtroom. All right, let's get started. So first I want to begin by making a little disclaimer or caution about how to use this video. The contents of this video is really a summary of a handbook I've written called the Practical Trial Handbook. So it's an overview, overview of the basic rules and strategies related to trial practice. As such, I'm not making any type of legal advice um, I might be citing the rules of evidence or, or the law, so always confirm that the law I'm citing or the rules of evidence are applicable in your jurisdiction and also confirm they're current. Lastly, the strategies and tactics I'm describing in this uh, video are simply my own suggestions and comments and not necessarily how other attorneys or judges I may feel about it. Of course, reasonable minds may differ. So I want to begin on the topic of trial objections by making a distinction between objections made pre-trial, for example, in motions and limine, uh, which are also objections. The objections I'm going to be talking about in this video are trial objections, meaning made while testimony is ongoing that you're going to come across. And so let's talk about what is a trial objection. Well, it's a procedural device used to notify the court that a party has an issue or a complaint. In other words, you're getting the judge's attention. And generally, a trial objection serves two main purposes. One is to keep your opponent in line and playing by the rules. In other words, your opponent has done something improper. You want to make an objection to keep them uh, following the rules. The other uh, important reason for making an objection during trial is to preserve the issue for a later appellate review. Because as I'm going to be talking about in a few mo moments, if you fail to object or make an improper objection, then you may forfeit your ability to have the matter reviewed on an appeal uh, it's called forfeiture. So those are two main reasons uh, you need to make good and proper objections. Um, here's a trial tip I wanted to start out with. At counsel table, have a cheat sheet with a list of the common objections available at your fingertip for quick reference including the hearsay exceptions. All right. Now, let's start off a little bit about the procedures of a trial objection. First of all, they must be timely and specific. Um, timely means the objection must be made at the time of the infraction. So you can't wait. Let's say uh, a hearsay issue crops up. You can't let the hearsay come in and wait three or four more questions or till your opponent has completed the examination and then make an objection. You have to make it timely, meaning right then at the moment it occurs. And it must be specific, meaning you can't just say object, your honor. You have to, let, you have to state the grounds and the proper legal grounds. Um, and uh, in a few minutes here, we're going to be going over some of the legal grounds for objections. But keep in mind that you must be uh, specific about the particular legal ground that you're objecting to. Um, commonly, I've seen attorneys happen before me, they'll say, objection, your honor, without giving me any ground of what the objection is. And judges who might be sticklers on the evidence code may simply say, overruled, mainly because you didn't state a reason or a ground. It might have been a good reason to object. There might have been some uh, uh, reason that the judge might have sustained it. That you didn't give an appropriate specific response or an objection. Now the other thing to know about uh, making an objection procedurally is that if the judge grants your um, motion, let's say you object on the grounds of hearsay, but the witness has already made an answer, um, of many jurisdictions require you to also make a motion to strike. So what you would do is, objection, your honor, hearsay, move to strike the answer. And that's assuming that the witness is answered. Of course, to make a timely objection, the best case is that you have objected prior to the witnesses making an answer. But that requires that you're paying attention and you're on the ball and it's really, it's like flipping a switch. You've got to be able to act almost instantly 
to, uh, before the, the witness uh, responds to the question. Now, if you don't make a, if, uh, one thing about the motion to strike, if you fail to make it in some jurisdictions, that basically they consider the issue, the answer still on the record because there's been no formal um, order by the court to remove it. And it could potentially, uh, again, back to forfeiture of an appeal. If you don't make the motion to strike, it could forfeit your, forfeit your ability to uh, have an appeal later on if uh, you believe that the judge's ruling was incorrect. Okay, so uh, here's a second trial tip. The, fa the failure to include a motion to strike is a common mistake. Whether or not to request the court to also admonish the jury to disregard the answer is a tactical consideration. So if the, if the um, information given to the jury or the court was significant enough and prejudicial enough to your case um, that you could say, Your Honor, I move to strike, the judge could grant it, you might also consider requesting the court to admonish the jury to disregard the evidence. Now that's a tactical question because it's like ringing the bell one more time for the jurors. Uh, so I'll leave that up to you to decide whether you want to make that have you know make that admonishment. Uh, but it might be something for you to consider. All right, let's talk about a little bit about the objection process. You make an objection. Now a couple things can happen. The judge may summarily overrule the objection with no argument. So if, it's a lead, if, the, if the objection is just a minor issue, such as a leading question, or the question was vague and ambiguous, and the judge sustains the objection, um, the judge may not allow you to argue it or even permit the lawyers to uh, make any argument to him about whether or not the ruling was appropriate. Um, some judges um, dis, uh, disallow what's called speaking objections, and I was one of them. I did not permit speaking objections. Speaking objections are where the attorneys want to argue the case in front of the jury, argue the issue in front of the jury. Say, for example, the issue was hearsay, and there was an appropriate objection, objection, Your Honor, hearsay. Now, the other side might feel that there's an appropriate uh, exception to the hearsay rule, um, so the judge generally wouldn't allow both sides to argue their case back and forth and back and forth while the jurors are sitting there taking it all in. So that's called a speaking objection. Most judges, and I was one of them, will limit you to the, um, to the appropriate legal responses. So for example, if it's a hearsay objection, the moving party would say, objection, your honor, hearsay. Um, the opposing party might say, um, Your Honor, it uh, falls within the exception of an excited utterance. And that would be all the judge would permit before the jury and the judge can make a ruling on that. Now, if for some reason it's a very important issue that's critical to your case um, and the judge is, uh, you, you're worried about how the judge may rule on it and you want to give more argument, you can have several options available depending on uh, how your court runs uh, his or her courtroom, the court, you could make a request to approach sidebar. Judge, may I approach on this issue? Uh, and uh, Or the, if it was important enough, the judge may even order the jurors out of the courtroom so it could be argued outside the presence of the jury. One consideration to think about if uh, you make a request to approach sidebar or at the bench, which often happens, is whether or not it can be reported. In some jurisdictions, uh, there's no court reporter up there at the bench, so if you're saying something important and then the judge makes a ruling, it may not be, it may not be on the record. So that means it's important for you or one of the parties to preserve the record by later, perhaps even at a break, say, Judge, may I put on the record what occurred at sidebar? Um, some courts are set up that the court reporter can record, report sidebar conversations. Um, and for example, in one of the courtrooms I've sat in, there was a microphone right up at the bench and the judge had a switch where he could flip it. And so if counsel leaned over and the judge was there and did kind of a semi whisper so that the jurors couldn't hear it, um, the court reporter could hear it and take down what was being said. Um, here's a trial tip. If the judge, uh, if, you, if you object and the judge responds overruled on that ground, it could be a hint that you have missed the correct objection. I want to talk a couple more things, uh, procedural things, before we move on to um, the common trial objections. One's called a standing or a continuing objection. And it might also be referred to as a placeholder objection. So what does that mean? It usually means that, let's say, uh, that you believe um, your opponent is wanting to introduce um, uh, hearsay improperly and you've made an objection, but the judge has overruled your objection. So the it's gonna come into evidence. 
Um, rather than you having to object over and over, perhaps during the testimony when it was made, you could just ask the judge to have a standing objection, meaning any time that information is elicited, you don't need to repeatedly object on the same issue, and um, therefore it will be preserved for the appellate review. And this is in lieu of having to object every time uh, the issue is introduced or revisited during out, throughout the trial. However, be cautious here because um, in order for the appellate court to consider it a good standing objection uh, or a continuing objection, the judge must have ruled on almost precisely the same issue. If it's a slightly different issue, it might require you to object again uh, because it's a sl slightly different question. And so again, what you're trying to do is preserve the issue for appeal. You don't want any argument later on an appellate review that you forfeited by not making objection. So um, a trial tip is if you lodge a continuing or standing objection, request a court to acknowledge on the record that you do not have to object again. So once the judge say, states to you on the record, um, counsel, I acknowledge you're, you're objecting to this form of evidence and I'll um, note that you have a standing objection then I think you're pretty safe with the appellate court going forward that it'll be deemed that you, you had uh, objected. Okay, let's talk about reasons uh, not to object. So, um, you know, I've seen some trials where usually they're newer attorneys and they object continuously throughout the entire trial over very minor and trivial things. And to, frankly, for the court and even for the jurors, they can, this can get annoying. And so uh, my rule of thumb and recommendation would be um, if it's a minor issue, then no harm, no foul. Don't keep objecting uh, over minor or trivial things because you have to be concerned about how it may, the perception the court may have or the jury that you're basically kind of being an obstructionist. And so this kind of leads to my trial tip. Be mindful how the jury perceives your objections. If you continually object regarding minor issues, the jury may become irritated and perceive you as an obstructionist, what I just said. So this is more of a tactical question. Um, you may need to object initially to set the tone, which is one of my recommendations. So if you run up against an attorney that's kind of what I call cheating, in other words, uh, let's say the question is leading questions, and the, the attorney is always is continually throwing leading questions in during their direct examination on substantive issues, in other words, important issues. Um, you know, it might be wise to object a few times right at the beginning, kind of set the tone, uh, because it is an important issue. So these, again, are tactical issues for you to decide, should you object or shouldn't you? If it's an important issue, the evidence is prejudice, prejudicial to your case, you probably should object. If it's a minor issue, no consequence, consider not objecting and just let it go by. All right, so now that we've kind of covered some of the procedural aspects of objecting, let's talk about the 18 most common trial objections you're going to run across. And remember, this doesn't necessarily have to be a jury trial. It can be a trial before the, uh, before the judge or a bench trial. It could be a family law hearing, any kind of evidentiary hearing where testimony is taken and it's um, you know, contested, most of these objections will be applicable. And the other thing I would advise is that you commit them to memory as much as possible. But you remember my trial tip at the beginning. If not, have a, have a cheat sheet in front of you to help you remember the most common objections because many of these objections will have to be made very quickly. Um, there's not a lot of time in the, as testimonies flowing. A lot of witnesses speak quickly. Testimony comes in in rapid succession. So you have to be totally on up to speed on the potential objections uh, that might be that, that could come into play and uh, also how to respond to them if you're, you're the opposing party. All right, so let's get to the 18 most common objections and I've kind of ranked them essentially in the order of what I see uh, from the most, most common kind of to the least common in the order generally. All right, let's talk about uh, objection number one, relevance. This is by far the most common objection made in the courtroom in any kind of trial or hearing. And uh, the definition of relevance is set forth in evidence codes and it's basically similar in all jurisdictions, but evidence is relevant if A, it has a tendency to make a fact more or less probable than it would be without the evidence, and B, the fact is of consequence in determining the action. And uh, you know, the, the corollary to that is irrelevant evidence is inadmissible. 
So now, relevance is just one of those things highly subjective depending on the type of case and the facts of your own particular case. So there's no recipe I can give you about how to determine if evidence is relevant. You only, this is kind of you know it when you see it kind of thing. But generally, if you're hearing, if, you, if you're um, listening to the testimony and suddenly your opposing attorney asks a question that seems to be out in left field, that seems to have really nothing to do with the uh, issues of, cons of consequence, then you just need to make the objection. Objection, you're not a relevance. And a lot of times, again, the judge may or may not respond to opposing counsel for a response. If it's very obvious, uh, the judge may say, may say, sustain, move on, counsel. And that's the end of it. So relevance is by far the most common trial objection that, that I've seen in the courtroom. The second most common one is vague and ambiguous. And generally this is where uh, counsel just puts together a poorly worded question. And it's an unclear. Uh, it's, uh, it could be a, with a double negative. It could be full of inconsistencies and just, it's just a very confusing, unclear question. And again, this is, you really, you'll know it when you see it. Just, we have to be paying attention. And when you hear your opposing counsel make a question that seems that you can't even understand, or a lot of times you take a clue from the witness who looks perplexed, you know, an objection, Your Honor, vague and ambiguous, would be an opportunity to object there. The question is poorly worded, confusing, for example, double, double negative. Here's a trial tip kind of in that same vein. Be particularly alert when opposing counsel propounds a long-winded question because there's a good chance that is vague and ambiguous and is probably also compound. So if you hear your opponent over here make a long, drawn-out question, you should be on high alert that it's vague and ambiguous. It also could be a compound question. It could be two or three questions all rolled into one. And you're kind of the protector. This might be your witness on the stand. So you're kind of protecting the witness from these types of questions. The way to do it is objection, Your Honor, vague and ambiguous. The third um, more common objection is speculation. And essentially, again, this is where you're asking the witness to uh, uh, make a guess. It can also go the other way if the wit if it's not necessarily the question being asked. It could be the answer being given could require a response. So if the... Um, if the witness responds and says something that appears to be a guess, speculation, conjecture, not based on what's called personal knowledge, then again, the objection would be appropriate. Objection, Your Honor, speculation. And you'll notice that some of these objections apply both to the question being asked, so it could be something the way the, your opponent has phrased the question, but it could also apply equally as well, as well to the answer given by the witness. It could be, uh, you know, speculative. All right. So number four, uh, leading question. Uh, this is very common and often mostly occurs when uh, the direct examination is going on and, a and an attorney asks a leading question during direct examination, which is generally prohibited. However, I want to make a caveat here. If you saw my video on cross-examination, I pointed out that often leading questions during direct are perfectly appropriate for non-contested issues. And many judges I will, will allow that because you need to get the case moving forward. The leading, question of is, uh, the leading question is objectionable during direct examination if it goes to a highly contested issue or fact. In other words, the meat of the case. Something is very important. If counsel starts giving leading questions, you know, then the appropriate objection is ob objection or other leading question. And uh, here's a uh, trial tip related to leading questions. Anticipate when opposing counsel may be tempted to use leading questions and object at the first instance to set the tone. If opposing counsel knows you are willing and able to object, they tend to police themselves better. And you'll see, if you've done many hearings or trials and you're sitting there um, hearing counsel do direct examination and it's getting to a very highly contested issue, you, you should be on alert then for the possibility of a leading question. And you can almost sense that counsel's building up uh, to a leading question. And so that's where you really need to jump in there and object uh, to it. And remember, the answer is, if, uh, remember, the, the procedure is if the witness answers before you can object, you may also be required to make a motion to strike. Um, another common objection made by attorneys is lack of foundation. Objection, Your Honor, lack of foundation. 
Now, actually, this is not necessarily a technically correct objection. Lack of foundation can, be, can mean many things. It means some foundational requirement has not yet been fulfilled uh, before evidence could come in. Now, the most, the most obvious example is authentication. So, um, for example, if, the, um, if your opponent's counsel has been leading at, has been asking the witness questions and hasn't laid out a foundation of authentication or that the witness um, was there to personally observe it or has personal knowledge, then they fail to lay out that preliminary aspect before the evidence is admissible and therefore a lack of foundation uh, uh, objection may be appropriate. So my trial tip in this regard is the lack of foundation objection is often made incorrectly by not stating the specific foundational element that is lacking. For example, personal knowledge or proper uh, authentication. So actually, if the, your opposing counsel has failed, for example, to establish personal knowledge, um, and one example of this, let's say the witness is um, talking about uh, a car accident in an intersection, a traffic collision, and the, your opposing counsel might be asking questions that seem to assume that the witness saw it, but the witness hasn't actually said yet that they are a recipient witness. And then the witness goes on to say, yeah, the red car ran the red light you might say objection on or lack of foundation personal knowledge because your opposing counsel hasn't yet established that the witness actually saw it happen. And sometimes I've seen it occur where the witness will testify on direct examination as though they had seen it. Yeah, the, the red car ran the red light. And then on cross-examination, um, it's elicited that, well, I didn't actually see the red car run the red light, but that's what the officer told me afterwards, or that's what I assumed. I just put two and two together. It seemed obvious to me, but there wasn't any personal knowledge. So again, this is where you can have a lack of foundation, lack of personal knowledge um, in that regard. And that kind of brings me to number six here, which I've kind of already tipped my hand on, and that is lack of personal knowledge. What I've just described is this is generally where the witness doesn't have any personal knowledge, hasn't seen it him or herself, hasn't, uh, uh, and that's a requirement for lay testimony generally. Uh, the rule is basically all witnesses must have personal knowledge. The exception to that, of course, is experts who uh, are allowed to give their opinions uh, based on other information and hearsay, and so they don't have personal knowledge. Um, but most lay witnesses, if they're going to come in before and explain to a jury uh, you know, what they saw at the scene of a traffic collision, they have to have personal knowledge. They must have actually perceived it, heard it, you know, with their own eyes, sensed it, um, personal knowledge. In other words, have been a recipient witness. Okay, uh, another um, common objection is non-responsive. And in my video on cross-examination, uh, if you haven't seen that yet, you should watch it. But this is often a very common objection um, during cross uh, made by the examiner on cross-examination when the witness is not responding to the question correctly. So the examiner um, using uh, leading questions may have asked a question that only required a yes or no and the witness was non-responsive by said yes and then added more information. In other words, the witness um, responded to more information that you required. Or sometimes on leading, you'll ask a question that requires a yes or no, and the witness dodges the answer and just adds their own uh, information. You know, the light was red, bef the, the light was yellow before you entered the intersection, wasn't it? And the witness said, well, the other car ran it. In other, in other words, the witness never even answered your question. Then the objection would be objection on or non-responsive. The non-responsive answer could apply to any witness, any witness that basically doesn't respond to the question. So be alert for that. Number eight uh, is basically just compound. It's basically a, a, a compound question. It's basically two questions rolled into one. It would also probably qualify as a vague and ambiguous question. Uh, so be alert for that. I've already given you the trial tip uh, you know, about that. One trial tip I forgot to mention regarding non-responsive is uh, the non-responsive objection is a good method to keep the witness in check during cross-examination with one caveat. Ensure the question only calls for a yes or no answer. If the question is poorly phrased or cannot be answered without explanation, the court may overrule the objection, making you look like the bad guy. Alright, let's go to number nine. 
uh, hearsay. Um, now this isn't a video on hearsay. You can take a whole law school class in evidence on hearsay. But it comes up fairly frequently during a trial. You'd be surprised how often. And so basically, uh, you know, just be alert um, that there could be a hearsay question that could require a hearsay answer. And again, the, one of the keys is that you object before the answer is given. So you don't have to, uh, you, the jurors don't hear it. Because as I think one court famously said, you can't unring a bell. So once the jurors have heard it, even if the judge said disregard that, well, you know, they heard the answer. Uh, and so now what do you do? And so um, one, uh, I've kind of come up with my cheat sheet for hearsay, and you should have it at trial counsel, is just remember what the elements of hearsay are. It says, you know, the questions you have to go through in your own mind is, is there a statement? Uh, because only statements of witnesses or people are hearsay. Is it being offered for the truth of the matter? And there are a lot of reasons that it might not be offered for the truth. If it's not being offered for, for the truth, then the next inquiry by the court will be, then what's the relevance of the non-hearsay purpose? And then if it is being offered for the truth, the next question to determine is, is there an applicable exception to the rule? Because many evidence codes have laid out very um, carefully the noted exceptions to the hearsay rule. So there's a lot of information here. Uh, you really need to be up on it if you're a trial lawyer. Uh, because it does come to play fairly frequently right in the middle of the trial. Things you hadn't even thought of where the witness said, you know, where there could be hearsay elicited. And you need to be prepared to respond to that. Uh, number 10 uh, is a, an objection improper lay opinion. Um, so this is, you see this from time to time. And this is where uh, the witness uh, either is asked a question that requires um, to make a, an improper lay opinion. In other words, an opinion that is um, that uh, lay witnesses can, are not permitted to make, or the witness gives something uh, that is more in line with expert an expert opinion, or it's based on speculation. So now, lay opinion. In other words, the witness is a non-expert. Um, they can give their opinions. It's, they're not prohibited from making any opinion, and um, the many of the rules of evidence do allow lay opinion if it's rationally based on the witness perception and helpful to clearly, clearly understand the witness's testimony or to in determining a fact and issue and not based on scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge within the scope of Rule 702. Now this is from the federal rules. Rule 702 uh, describes and talks about expert testimony. So um, this sometimes is kind of interesting uh, about how far witnesses can go in making lay opinion. And some of the courts, I just think it's important to think about some of the language, what courts have said about lay opinion. Um, and here's what one court said. The opinion rule for non-experts merely requires that a witness express themselves at the lowest possible level of, of abstraction. Whenever feasible, concluding should be left to the jury. However, when the details observed, even though, recall, uh, even though recalled, are too complex or too subtle for a concrete description by the witness, he or she may state his general impressions. So a good example of this is um, a, a, a witness being asked uh, about intoxication. And the witness may say, yeah, he looked like he was drunk. Now, when a witness says a person looks like they're drunk, intoxicated, um, courts have also upheld angry, upset, sad, um, even one court I think said crazy. Now those are all opinions if you think about it. But they're, they're so subtle that it's hard to like, um, distill it down any further. We all know from looking at someone when they, whether they look sad or happy or upset, or we often have seen people that look intoxicated, but to try to describe that to some third party and have it make sense, too difficult. So those are impro uh, proper lay opinions. And so it often comes up in uh, and where it can get a little bit gray is if the witness makes a lay opinion about intent. So, for example, I think a witness could say, yeah, he looked really mad, you know, or he was acting frantic, or the witness was hysterical. Uh, uh, but what the witness can't go is to try to make an opinion about what the witness, what the, what the per actor was thinking. Yeah, he was angry, and he looked like he was going to kill him. See, now you've kind of crossed over into an opinion about the mental state of the actor that's being described. 
And the judge might sustain that because now that's really almost into speculation. Um, that might be the realm of expert testimony. Um, so you generally, um, lay opinion can't really go into um, speculating or forming an opinion about what someone else was thinking. You can describe how they acted, um, what their appearance was, that they looked drunk, upset, angry, uh, hysterical, but you can't go into what their actual mental state was. That then would be improper lay opinion. All right, that's kind of a short explanation of that. Uh, another objection is called assumes facts not in evidence, and this is generally when some preliminary fact has not been established. So this will occur when your opponent is asking questions to a witness, and um, the opponent's questions seem to assume for example, that the witness was personally present at the scene of the accident and saw it. You know, so the, the first questions of a witness might be, now when the red car ran the red light, where were you seated? Or, I mean, where were you standing? Well, objection on that assumes facts not in evidence because the witness has never testified yet that he or she was even present or had any personal knowledge. You can see how some of these objections kind of tie together a little bit. Assumes facts not of evidence could also be similar to no personal knowledge. Number 12, misstates the evidence. This is less common, but it generally occurs often when an attorney asks a question to a witness and the attorney might misstate the facts. Um, you know, for example, um, yesterday you heard Officer Jones uh, testified A, B, C, or D, and the attorney just misstated what was said. Um, could be an example. You know, one thing I've noticed that can get kind of confusing even for jurors. So a lot of times uh, on cross-examination, the attorney will ask the witness what they said previously at the same hearing at an earlier time. Say it was a break. Uh, the witness testified yesterday and now is back on the stand for cross-examination. And the witness will ask, and the, the attorney will ask the witness, do you recall yesterday when you testified that you thought the, uh, that the traffic light was yellow? And so again, so what's happening is the attorney is summarizing or paraphrasing what the witness purportedly said the day before. And a lot of times the attorney gets it a little bit wrong or puts a little spin on it. And so this is where you sitting there listening to it might want to object, objection or misstates the evidence because that might not be exactly what the witness said yesterday. And sometimes words are important, obviously in a trial, you know, words can have great importance in a trial of how exactly things were said. Number 13 is argumentative. Now an argumentative question usually is made by your opponent uh, during cross examinations where you see it most often. And it's basically an argumentative question is one that really isn't a question asking for any legitimate response. It's really making a statement or an accusation, um, kind of a point, so to speak, for the jurors. I recall there was one case where the defendant's fingerprints were found on a safe and the charge was burglary and the defendant was on the stand and the prosecutor asked something like, well, are you saying that the fingerprints are lying too? Now obviously that's not a real question, that's just an argumentative question to make the point. And so that would be one example. Um, so if you feel that the, your opposing attorney's questions are getting out of line, they're not really asking for facts or evidence, they're making, trying to make a point to the jury, the appropriate argument is, um, the, pro the appropriate objection is argumentative. However, my trial tip is a question is generally not, not argumentative merely because the cross-examiner turns up the heat and confronts the witness with, say, an inconsistency or suggests an improper motive. So merely because you're aggressive in your cross-examination or you may be implying or you're actually accusing the witness of being untruthful, that, that is probably not argumentative. That's just good, aggressive cross-examination. All right, number 14 is narrative. Narrative generally occurs during the direct examination where the witness is basically allowed to just ramble on. And you'll kind of note it, basically direct examination should go question and answer, but not little short bits and pieces. You know, the witness should be uh, allowed to give, uh, you know, some narration, otherwise it'd just be too choppy. But when the witness keeps going and going and maybe even digresses or goes off some tangent, then the appropriate would object, objection would be objection, your honor, narrative. And then what should happen then is opposing counsel should just 
ask the next question. If it's direct examination, the easiest way is to say, well, then what happened? What happened next? But at least you're going in a question and answer format. Asked and answered, number 15, uh, can occur um, often mainly on direct examination where the examiner, the attorney, just keeps asking the witness the same question, requiring the same response repeatedly, just to make the point, so to speak. So if you see that happening, now generally the court will give a little leeway if the, if the counsel appears to be clearing something up or asking it a slightly different way, that might be okay. But if it appears that the attorney is just trying to make the point for the jury by having the witness repeat damaging testimony one, t one more time, asked and answered uh, might be the, the uh, appropriate objection. Generally asked and answered would not be seen much on cross-examination because cross-examination you're given much more leeway. So generally, I, as a trial court judge, I would not sustain an objection for asked and answered on cross-examination because after all, it is cross-examination, the examiner is given much more leeway, and the examiner can go out at different means. All right. Uh, number 16, moving on here, um, undue prejudice. I don't want to spend a lot of time. This is um, rarely seen during the trial. This is a motion uh, in federal court is called a 403 motion. In California, for example, it's called a 352. It's generally when uh, you, you feel that the evidence being introduced, even if it's relevant, should be excluded by the court under these statutes because it's unduly prejudicial. And often we see this in motions in limine at the front end of the trial and uh, rarely or less common during the actual trial itself uh, because these issues are usually taken up ahead of time. One trial tip is if a 403 type issue occurs during testimony, it's a good time to request a sidebar or perhaps even an evidentiary hearing outside the presence of the jury. Uh, one common 403 type issue is when one party seeks to introduce bad character evidence regarding the opposing party witness. Uh, or it's something very damaging. Improper character evidence, number 17, it would be similar to undue prejudice. It's when one side wants to introduce or ask a witness questions about uh, character evidence. Now, character evidence like hearsay is a whole body of law that could, again, take up a whole law school semester talking about the various forms of character evidence. The general rule, very general rule, is that character evidence is not permitted in trial or in evidence, but there are many exceptions to it. For example, character evidence in criminal cases can be admitted uh, to prove uh, intent or motive uh, or circumstantial evidence, but it has to meet certain criteria. Character evidence might also be relevant uh, to show for um, uh, character of the, of the witness for truthfulness or untruthfulness, but they, they're a little bit complex. If it comes up, improper, objection on or improper character evidence would be the objection to make. Lastly, number 18, beyond the scope. Generally, uh, the cross-examiner is said to be limited to the scope of the direct examination, but there's a caveat to that, is that the law does permit uh, cross-examination on issues dealing with witness credibility. So perhaps the witness is talking about you know, a traffic collision and then the cross-examiner starts going off on issues not necessarily related to the traffic collision, but perhaps witness, related to the witness's credibility, the judge might allow um, some leeway there uh, uh, that would go beyond the scope. But if you think that your attorney, uh, your opposing attorney, is just going off on something that you didn't even bring up, um, you know, it would be beyond the scope. It might also be relevance, could be the objection. So now I've just very quickly gone over the 18 you know, common trial objections. There are more than this, but I've just tried to hit the main ones that you would most likely see in the middle of trial. And again, the key is um, think about having a little cheat sheet with you. You gotta make the objection very quickly. If the, if the witness is answered, make a motion to strike. And the other thing is on the other side, if you're the responding party, um, just like knowing how to make the objection, you, know, you need to know how to respond. So that's why it's equally as important uh, that you understand the exceptions to these rules or when it is permitted so that if your opposing attorney makes an objection, you can respond back to the judge and with, you know, with a response that makes sense. So that concludes this uh, you know, brief you know, 40 or 50 minute talk here on trial objections. I hope you found it important. I think if you studied the things I've said here today, you could do a pretty competent job in any kind of trial hearing, uh, objecting, responding uh, to the various objections uh, that we've been discussing today. 
And that brings me kind of to my final point. Um, if you think this is interesting or you liked it, uh, you know, be sure and hit the like button. You can subscribe to my channel. But the bottom line is I've created a handbook called the Practical Trial Handbook where I cover all of this, an entire trial from beginning to end, whether it's a court or bench trial. And it's uh, what I like to say, it, it covers everything that every a trial lawyer, lawyer needs to know in order to competently try any type of case, meaning whether it's a civil trial, criminal case, family law, any hearing where evidence is introduced in any jurisdiction. So you don't really need to know from a handbook the substantive law. I don't go into any of that. The rules of evidence in many of the courts are very similar, if not identical. So this handbook covers all these components of a trial that you just need to know in order to be a competent trial lawyer. If you get the handbook, it's on sale, pretty good price too, uh, $39.95. It won't make you a Clarence Darrow or really highly polished trial lawyer, but it'll give you the basics and it'll allow you to uh, understand the fundamentals and do a good job in the courtroom. And I would highly recommend it for law students um, thinking about going into litigation because it really is nuts and bolts, which is different than I believe a lot of the other trial practice handbooks talk about. It's less formal and my trial tips are very informal, things that I just feel will be helpful uh, in, in you know, putting your case on. So thank you very much and good luck in the courtroom.